As the Cross Purposes tour neared the end, there were intentions for Geezer Butler and Bill Ward to record a new album with the two Tonys and Jeff Nichols. However, that proved to be too hard a task for them to complete. Determined to continue, it was decided to bring some old friends back into the fold. Well, let's talk a little bit about Black Sabbath, because you have a new album out titled Forbidden. Um, who's actually playing on this record with you? Because it's a different lineup to the last album. It is, yes. It's, uh, it's Cozy Fowl. It's the same lineup as we had in 1990, actually. It's Cozy Fowl on drums, uh, Neil Murray on bass, Tony Martin vocals, Jeff Nichols keyboards, and myself. Uh, Goose and myself had a disagreement, and um, so, you know, that, that band sort of disintegrated. And um, so immediately I, I wanted, you know, to get onto Cozy and, and Neil and um, and get that lineup back because that lineup was a, a great working lineup. We all work well. We have great relationship with each other, and um, I just wanted to do that. So I phoned everybody up, and they says no. <laughs> so you're glad to be back, back, Cozy? Yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, the situation before, unfortunately, I had a bit of bad accident with a horse fell on top of me, and that put me out of action for about six months. And uh, obviously things moved on. Tony got together with Geezer and Ronnie again. I worked with Brian May in the meantime. And then Brian's tour finished and we were sort of doing some recording and then Tony phoned up and said, would you like to come back and do the next album? So here I am. And it's nice to, nice to be back as well. Well, in my case, really, when I joined the band, um, it was because Geezer had decided that he didn't want to rejoin at that particular time. So throughout my period with the band a few years ago, I always thought that it was quite likely that Geezer would want to come back into Black Sabbath, which obviously was, you know, a very good thing. You know, he was a very important founder member of the band. <clears throat> so when the chance came for Geezer and Ronnie James Dio to come into the band, then obviously myself and Tony it wouldn't be able to be in the band at the same time. When I pick musicians for the for the lineup, it's it's people who who really want to do it, you know. And, and if they don't want to do it, then they move on. Um, they have to be uh, really want to do it and really like what we do. I don't just want a, a musician to come in. I want somebody who loves and knows about the music, about what Sabbath's about. Iomi noted that Neil and Cozy were not involved at the very beginning of the writing process as they were still finishing up other projects, so Martin, Nichols, and himself already had a wealth of ideas when they joined in. In under just three weeks it was all written, with rehearsals during October and November 1994 at Bluestone Farm in Pembrokeshire, Wales. Now, um, you know, you guys have recorded something like over 20 albums now. How do you keep things creative and challenging? Uh, well, it, touch wood, it, it hasn't been a problem yet. I don't have a problem coming up with new ideas and riffs and stuff. And I think uh, with the enthusiasm in the band, it, it really does, that's the major part of it, is, is to creating. And we had no problem at all with this album. We were, we were coming up with so much stuff, and we've got loads of stuff, uh, material left, you know. Um, it's just come really, really easy. I mean, but do you feel any pressure to make each album kind of an event and, you know, to also, of course, to live up to the name as well? Not really, no, we just go in and, and uh, whatever sounds good. The idea is originally was to go in and make an ultra heavy album, but when you start writing stuff and it comes out and you go, well, oh, I like this one and everybody else likes it, then we use it and it may not be as heavy as some, but we all like it and then we, we make them, we use those. When we started the Forbidden album, I've got video of us in the rehearsal of writing and it was great, you know, we were all having a laugh and, and getting on and the songs were sounding, you know, pretty heavy. And Tony, I understand that you took a different approach to the lyrics and the vocals on this album, that you kind of were very kind of freeform. Oh, absolutely. It was kind of scary in some respects that it never worked this way before. Um, we knew we wanted to make the album this kind of way, you know, raw and spontaneous, but I had no idea how it was going to work, and so I just went in basically with the backing tracks that the guys had already fixed up, you know, verse, chorus, verse, whatever it might have been. And then uh, I just started singing and it all sort of came out kind of, you know, verbal vomit. I don't know what it is. <laughs> that, must have, that sounds to me like it was just like very much kind of emotions pouring out kind of thing. 
Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, all I knew was that I wanted to get onto the human emotion thing in the same way that Paranoid did. And um, so I, I figured the best way to do that is just to sing from the heart and from the mind and just and go in there and do it. And it worked really well. The lyrics and the melodies worked together at the same time and they sort of worked with what the... With Tony, we're it, it, lucky with it because he can, you can throw him a riff and it can be an unusual riff and he can sing across it where in the past with other vocalists, um, they'd maybe follow, like in Ozzy's day, he, he used to follow the riff a lot. Get a Grip was originally titled Black Ice, as labeled on Cozy Powell's tape of the rough mixes, Bernie C. told Tony Martin that it wasn't a good idea, because of Ice-T being black and that his name was Ice, so Ernie looked over the lyrics and he came up with Get a Grip. But Rusty Angels, yeah, that's a cool track, I like that one. Um, that was actually about a, a place in the desert somewhere you guys have got, where they keep all the military planes that they take them to... Um, well, they take them out of commission and they store them. And uh, so it's about warplanes that are being decommissioned, very rusty angels. This one's called Can't Get Close Enough to You.
more about the new Sabbath album, Forbidden, and there's um, a lot of diversity on the material on that record. Um, you know, really hard rockers right through to kind of ballads. I know you've, you've kind of always done that, but do you think this um, album says anything new about Sabbath? Pretty much. Um, we're spreading our wings a little more, and um, this is a band that is not scared of experimenting with music. Um, we'll take every possible twist or turn and throw it in there, especially Tony's guitarists are so really spectacular, some of them. So it's a real challenge uh, to be able to work together in that way and um, just e expand you know, as much as we can and keep the thing going. And it's really good. I really enjoy the album and hopefully it's going to bring us into uh, the now thing and take us into the future thing. You know? After putting together all the songs, it was time to get a producer. Leith Masses was considered again, but IRS Records convinced Tony Iommi that they needed a younger producer, one with a more from the street feel, thinking Black Sabbath had lost that in themselves. Ice-T is one of the founding fathers in the mainstream appeal of rap music, gaining success with albums and movie roles starting in the 80s. Ice-T's interest in heavy metal music stemmed from sharing a room with his cousin Earl, who was a fan of metal, and only listened to the local rock radio, Ice-T particularly enjoyed Black Sabbath, Ice-T attended Crenshaw High School, where he met a few other black classmates that liked metal, including guitarist Ernie C., the two would form the rap metal crossover band Body Count, with Ernie C. eventually moving into the producer's role. Body Count would be accepted into the metal community with open arms, scoring hits such as Cop Killer, and winning Grammy Awards. Tony C um, really came in pretty early on while we were uh, putting the songs together. <clears throat> came down to rehearsals um, and started to give it a direction back then. Um, and gradually, step by step, we put it together. Um, we started to uh, mix it in America, but then it came back over to England, where we were all able to sort of have a listen and find out which direction it was going in. 
Oh, it was an idea that was put forward um, by the management, mm -hmm. really. Um, so, uh, from my point of view, it was kind of quite a surprise. You know, it was really a, you know, original thing to sort of suggest, <laughs> and I was kind of um, wondering how that one was going to turn out. But gradually, as each stage went on, it turned out really good. Um, on the whole, I think we've been very pleased with it. It's gone. Yeah. It was a different approach for us all to go because we all wondered what what it was going to be like, and we all thought, well, I don't know about that. Yeah, I mean, most of the tracks were played live. We, we just literally rehearsed them first and got them how we wanted them, and we just went into the studio. A lot of the tracks were done within one and two takes, and I think Ernie wanted to capture that spirit of Black Sabbath. I mean, the reason, another reason he came along was because he was influenced originally by the band anyway, as was Ice-T, which we found out at some point. And they, and they both said they would like the chance to be able to work with us, and we, again, it's a, such a different area for us to, to, to sort of move into that we thought it would be a challenge. So we, you know, and it's worked out to be, it could have been disastrous, but it's <laughs> turned out really good. We, t we talked a little bit when I spoke to you earlier, Tony, um, at the Kerrang Awards, that you work with Ernie C. Um, from Body Count, of course. Unusual choice of producer. Do you think he helped kind of bring you bang right into like 95 with, with his input? I think it helped in a, as far as uh, vibing us up, you know. And uh, and yes, it probably just, we, we maybe would have changed a couple of things if it weren't for Ernie. Because we were going and I, I, was, I was quite all ready to do some more guitars on it. And you're going, oh, no, no, that's fine. Keep it like that. So it probably, you know, kept it more raw. Tony was given some CDs of body count and liked its sound. Ernie recalls that it was Tony who called him first. Tony came to Ernie's hotel room while he was in London, and the two agreed to work together rather quickly. Ernie's mindset was that Sabbath's 80s and 90s albums were too big production-wise, so he was going to dry the sound quite measurably. He used the way Nirvana albums sounded as his benchmark. The sound on Cross Purposes turned towards a drier sound than Headless Cross and Tear, Forbidden was just the next step beyond that, perhaps instead, it was a jump ahead that was too far. Recording started on December the 4th 1994, at the Parr Street Studios of Liverpool, the bass and drum parts were completed by December 10th, with vocals keyboards and guitars done by December 14th, but further recording was done as the album was mixed in London and Los Angeles in March 1995. I understand that the album was written in just three weeks and recorded in a mere ten days, which is uh, no mean feat by anybody's standards. Um, do you feel that this makes it one of the most spontaneous albums you've ever recorded? Yeah, it is. It's uh, it's the third fastest album since uh, you know the first three albums, the first two albums we had, Black Sabbath and Paranoid, were were done very quick. <coughs> and this is the third fastest one we've ever done. Yeah. So it's kind of going back to that vibe when you first started. That's right. But we wanted to achieve that. They wanted to get in and, and record an album. Uh, very basic without doing, you know, spending a week on drum sound, a week on guitar sounds, then overdubs and all that stuff. Just wanted to go in and just play live, which is what we did. That must have been very refreshing. <laughs> it was good actually, because it was over before you thought about it, and bloody hell, it's, it's, it's finished. <laughs> At the time, the guys in the band spoke very highly about the making and final outcome of the album. In more recent years, however, their true feelings have been expressed. Forbidden. How was the vibe of that album? Uh, we have to go. Uh, where do we go? It, it was. It was starting to feel a bit like a a job, and you don't want music to feel like that. It's, it's just you know you want to be enjoying yourself and and doing whatever. But it was getting. Um, I don't know. Like distant. The guys in the band were getting distant. So by the time we come to do Forbidden. We were already, you know, a bit like uh, lethargic about it. Well, Cozy was in the studio and we had a bit of a laugh in uh, joking about in the uh, rehearsals and writing and stuff. And I thought, oh, wait, oh, wait a minute. This is actually getting good again. <laughs> and um, we sort of went along with it. And then all of a sudden this suggestion came from somewhere. I'm not sure if it was management or Tony. And just suddenly this suggesting that they were going to get iced tea to sing on it <laughs> and we were like no so well, how's that gonna work then they said well um ernie c is gonna come over i have to say they're great guys really really nice guys and in 1995 you made a guest performance on forbidden by black sabbath yeah illusion of power what i think they were trying to do is the uh, run dmc thing like you know with uh, aerosmith 
right you know, that kind of thing that's what i think they were trying to uh, achieve but it's black sabbath man yeah. I mean, you know we got the call from black sabbath saying black sabbath wants us to produce the forbidden album so they're like is it's ashton <laughs> crutcher or some shit who uh, really but they had heard us praising Black Sabbath so much, and we were hot at the moment. So Ernie went over there, worked with Tony Iommi, helped them produce the album, and then they called me. They said they didn't want me to do a guest vocal on Illusion of Power. I also worked with Lemmy from Motorhead. That's right. So I, I, I've been very fortunate to work with the heavies. You know, there's lots of bands, but then there's heavy people, you know. But Ernie C came over, and then he started telling Cozy Powell how to play drums. Oh no! <laughs> and Cozy Powell saying, "Right, okay, I'll I'll try it for you." <laughs> he said, "But you know, it's going to be me that's playing it, and it's going to sound like Cozy Powell." Yeah, yeah, okay, but like if we can just throw a few ideas your way, okay. If you can imagine Cozy Powell sitting there, and he's he's got his hand on his hip and his drip sticks in his hand, and and they're saying, "Right, can you play this? Can can you play that?" And and Cozy's looking at them with that look that says, "You do know who I am, right?" you know, Cozy Pal, and he yeah, 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 we know, you're great, we love what you do, man, it's like, really cool, uh, but can you try this? And he said, all right, I'll give it a try. Um, so trying to teach Cozy Pal how to play drums is, like, not really great. So Cozy Pal said, look, this isn't going to work. And I said, I don't think it's going to work. Um, then suddenly there was a meeting called in London, so we all ended up, in an office in London, uh, and they were saying, look, this is going to happen. Um, regardless of what you sort of feel about it, it is going to happen. Um, how do we make it work? kind of thing so we went back into the studio Ernest C came in again and started directing it and, oh, okay so we hit this sound this idea of the way it was gonna be um but then it started to go cold again and I couldn't get any confirmation from them if I was actually going to be singing I had no idea I was getting this impression that I was going to be in the not going to be in the band and so I kept you know contacting them and saying am i actually doing this or what and they were saying well yeah just keep going keep going and uh, we'll decide you know who's singing what later i'm going well that's completely useful <laughs> yeah it just gives doesn't give me any clue at all about you know it doesn't make me feel confident and you know i'm starting to lose it now that like the the interest i mean well i didn't like it cozy pal didn't like it jeff nichols was like really uncertain about it um uh, iomi was into it and his management was into it um but we were like totally bemused in, in the <laughs> beginning and then we got to the actual studio to record this and i said look uh, who's singing what am i just doing this as a guide for like you know i see to come and sing is he singing one song is he singing five songs is he singing all of them am i singing anything and they said, well, yes, uh, keep going. We, we haven't decided. This is what they actually wrote back to me and said, we haven't decided what format the band is going to be in. And I went, what does that mean? <laughs> Ernie C. dispels the notion that Ice-T was going to do the whole album. Ernie thought of bringing Ice-T in to do a guest appearance on one song only. All the songs were written so that they could be sent over to Ice-T for him to decide which one to appear on, which spot would best fit his appearance. Perhaps it was IRS Records that was toying with having Ice-T do the entire album and they were the ones not telling Tony Martin the extent of Ice-T's involvement. Ernie C. would later say this experience made him decide not to produce established bands, as they are so set in their ways. Okay, that's not helping me now, because now I've already been fired once, so now I'm thinking, uh, okay, this doesn't look good, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe there's something going on here. Well, through my manager, I'd heard that, that they was already talking to Ozzy about various things and that. So I kind of knew that that was sort of going on. Um, but they wouldn't tell me for sure what my position was. And so now I was really insecure. 
even when I was in the studio recording it, I still didn't know if I was going to be actually on the record in the band kind of thing. Yeah. So I couldn't concentrate. I didn't. I couldn't give it everything, and the whole rap thing was just a little bit out there. I just couldn't concentrate. I couldn't put any feeling into it. I couldn't get the vibe on it. I'd written some lyrics and I was, I was trying to write more lyrics and I just couldn't, I couldn't get into it at all. And so for me, set against that background, it was really hard. Um, I, I didn't get into it at all. The album would see its worldwide release in June of 1995. It was tentatively titled The Illusion of Power, but somewhere along the line it was changed to Forbidden. Well, I think the title comes from the lyrics, and, and Tony writes the lyrics, so you'd have to ask him really more about any real meaning to it. I think it's, when it comes to choosing an album title, you know, <clears throat> the usual thing is to find one of the songs that really, in a way, reflects the whole album. Um, and in some way, it, it's a slightly kind of dark image that's conjured up, and that in conjunction with the album sleeve and... That's a dark image, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it is on the front. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it could have been called The Illusion of Power, it probably could have been called lots of things, but... Uh, it's called Forbidden. Ernie C. later expressed that the version out there is somewhat of a hodgepodge of final mixes, the reaction from IRS Records was mixed about the finished product, their opinions were that it sounded too dry and had too much of a Nirvana spin to it, which was sort of Ernie's goal, so some other guy started to remix it, giving it that 80s sound, but that quickly turned to confusion. So Ernie was called back to England to patch up the production, Brian May came down to the studio and listened to Ernie's work, he liked the sound and told Iomi that this was like what Sabbath sounded like 20 years ago, so it was decided that the album was done. However, not everything was fixed back to Ernie's original, plus he did make some new changes as needed, he simply wasn't finished with it but this third incomplete mix ended up going on sale. Well there's no video from Forbidden yet, is there Cozy, but I understand that you're going to do a, a video for the first single The Illusion of Power which also features Ice-T as well. That's right, they're working on it at the moment, it's going to be a, a cartoon type format, so it's slightly different and it's going to be it's very similar to the album cover which is a, a slightly different way we've gone about it and that'll, that's, I think that's going to be out within the next two or three weeks. So they're working on it now, so you should be seeing it on Headbangers Ball very shortly. The album's cover art was by cartoonist Paul Sample, Paul is most famous for his comic character Augury, the subsequent music video for Get a Grip basically makes a cartoon out of the characters on the album's artwork, Augury is the guy riding the motorcycle throughout the video. On the album's artwork are members of the band and various crew, including Ice-T, IRS Records owner Miles Copeland, engineer Bobby Brooks, Tony Iommi's dogs, Ozzy and Sharon, Ernie C., and rumored to be Cozy's girlfriend. A second single for Guilty as Hell would be released at the beginning of the tour. Fans didn't treat this album with much attention, after the most lineup changes any band has ever had, you really can't blame the public too much, the negative reviews are among some of the most ruthless, problems for fans about this album include the fact that they had a rapper guest vocalist, it sounded flat and lifeless with little effort. That it sounded like Tony Martin wasn't even trying to sing, one review suggested Martin might as well have phoned in the words, you could tell that Cozy Powell was on Headless Cross and Tear, on this album it was more like, who cares, his impact was to such a low degree that he might as well had used this time to do something else. In fact I have found more than one review that got the name of the album wrong. 
Then you have those fans that love the album, that gets into the dry garage band sound, appreciating how different the album is, you also have a small percentage that falls into the, it has a good song or two, category. Cozy Powell and Tony Martin felt so strongly about the negative side that they refused to listen to the album after the fact. In Tony Martin's solo career it is the one Sabbath album that he performs zero songs from. I, I couldn't really get a grip of it. Uh, and that's one of the songs. No pun intended. Get a grip. Uh, yeah. <laughs> get a grip. Yeah. Um, so it was all very uncertain and it, and it kind of unfolded from there. So for me, Forbidden is not a great album. Uh, but you know what? There are people out there that love it. And I don't understand. Kiss of Death Tony is an epic track. You like I, that? I, I, I love that song, Kiss of Death. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, you're obviously seeing something in it that I, I didn't think I'd portrayed. I, you know, to me, it was I was just half existing and, and a bit lackluster, yeah. you know. But uh, like I said, you, the, the, there are people out there that like it. So, hey, who, what do I know? Took a gamble with the album Forbidden, which is not well known at all. Um, and in terms of the production, it really didn't sound like sabbath normally would it was very dry and not particularly heavy sounding and in retrospect that was probably a mistake to try and go in that direction and try and sound more like what metal bands were sounding like in the mid 90s but by the time it's out and you've got the reaction to it you sort of it's too late. You can't go back and redo it. You're stuck with it. There has always been the rumor that this was a throwaway album, done to let Tony Iommi out of his contract with IRS Records. That really isn't true, as The Sabbath Stones was the album that fulfilled that, which is a package of tracks from the Born Again to Forbidden albums. Much like the other albums, distribution for Forbidden was lacking, the album was just not on the shelves as it should have been, but IRS did do a fair amount of promotion. Including full-page ads in music magazines, with a tour special dedicated to Black Sabbath on MTV Europe's Headbangers Ball, Japanese television would follow suit on Bang Up Rock. As the band went on tour, that's when the real troubles began. And we want to talk about sort of the atmosphere we're getting at the shows. It's absolutely amazing and electric for us. And uh, we have a great time on stage now with this lineup. And um, it's great playing, you know, the new and old songs. And it's great seeing everybody's faces and enjoying themselves. And you know what? Every gig is unique to you guys. Each place that we play is totally unique. Every crowd is different. Every venue is different. And it's really good to be on the road playing to all these new people that we're seeing out there. That's you. The tour begins on a good note, with appearances at big music festivals in Denmark and Sweden. In one particular interview, Tony Iommi said that IRS were doing a vastly improved job promoting the tour, Jeff Nichols would later say that Tony Iommi was the happiest he had been since 1990. Cozy, um, you promised a few surprises um, on this tour, now what exactly does that mean and can you tell us what viewers can expect when you come to <laughs> Europe? <laughs> Not you personally. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good. I think well, the surprises are obviously some different material that, that people won't have heard before, uh, and the selection of stuff we do from the past will be some songs that maybe people haven't heard the band play before. So that in, in itself will be nice to do for the first time. And I say, as I say, the new album will be doing some some tracks from that. So a bit of a mixture of all sorts, and the show running order will be different again as well. So we've got a bit, a little bit of everything there for everybody, right from the very first album right up to date. Cozy Powell would start the tour with the band on June 4, 1995. The band heads to California for a set of dates in August, where Cozy would make his parting point. His last concert with the band was on August 3, 1995 at the Universal Amphitheater. Cozy had rejoined the band with good intentions. He expressed that it just wasn't the same, and his discomfort just got worse. Compacted by his reduced role in the band, and his overall horrible experience making the album. Bobby Rondinelli is brought back for the rest of the Forbidden Tour, Tony Iommi really liked Bobby, and his playing during the Cross Purposes album and tour, Bobby's manager was the only rift between the two. 
Bobby was already on standby before Cozy Powell even left, and he was told to avoid being seen by Cozy. It's kind of silly because they didn't want me to run into Cozy. He was leaving anyway. You know, and I, I know he knew I was there. And it was it was like wherever he'd go, they'd say, oh, go the other way. I mean, it was like, I really felt like a, like a dummy. You know what I mean? I wanted to just go up and say, hi, how you doing, you know? But we became friends later. Hi, I'm Neil Murray. I'm Tony Iommi. Tony Martin. And I'm Bobby Rondinelli. Bobby's first forbidden concert would be August 19, 1995 at the Rock at the Border Festival in Gmund. Along with Jeff Nichols, this would be the final lineup of the Tony Martin era, completing a run of shows that would finish on December 14, 1995 at the Phoebus Amphitheater in Bangkok. The most talked about forbidden film would have to be August the 25th at the Orpheum Theater in Zyra Malta, this was professionally filmed for broadcast on Smash Television, both Tonys have commented on just how hot that show was, it was like playing in a sauna, Rondinelli stated that he could have cooked an egg on his cymbals. Late November through mid-December, the band was scheduled to tour Australia for the first time in ages, but that was cancelled before the first plane ticket could be bought. It is ironic that Tony Martin's first and last Black Sabbath concerts were also cancelled, there was to be a few more shows after Bangkok, on December 19, the band was set to play in Vietnam, but that was killed as government officials were knee-deep in religious protest. I lost the best friend that I ever had. She was my woman. I loved her so. But it's too late now. I let her go. In terms of performance, the reviews were mostly positive, Black Sabbath were putting on great shows during the tour, and the crowds were responding well. Particularly to songs that were re-added to the setlist like When Death Calls, War Pigs, and The Shining, some fans were citing that Tony Martin had finally found that spark that had been missing from his rendition of War Pigs on other tours. Europe was once again their strongest point. America, we had a little uh, thing at the time they thought that because um, Ozzy was out on the road at the same time and it kind of clashed with the Sabbath thing. So over to Europe and it really, really worked in Europe and they really took to it, you know, whether that's the mindset of the Europeans or you know, the kind of way the music sort of fell into their laps there. I don't know, but um, it certainly was bigger for me. Uh, in Sabbath in Europe than it was in America. Well, I'm afraid that's the end of the
participate, however, those sessions didn't fuse together until several years later. Tony Martin was under the impression that he would be called when Sabbath was ready to go again, in May of 1996, Tony Martin answered a fan letter where he said that as far as he knows, he was still in the band. The last official dealings with Tony Martin was when he was asked about the meaning of the song The Sabbath Stones, to be used in the CD liner notes and for promotional materials. Through December of 1996, Tony Iommi maintained that Tony Martin was still in the band, long story short, Tony Martin was never officially fired, just like in 1991, neither were Neil Murray or Bobby Rondinelli, in fact, it was MTV that broke the news to them. In fact, Ian Gillen said to me, he said, have you actually been fired? I said, well, yeah. He said, no, did they, did they call you and say, okay, you're fired? Did they send you a letter and say you're fired? I said, uh, no, um, I heard it from my manager who so, so he said, neither have I. He said, I reckon we're both still in the band. So what we should do is let's just go to one of the gigs and just walk on stage, like, you know, in the middle of their set or something. I said, well, oh, Ian, if you ever want to do that, mate, I'll do that. Cozy Powell and Jeff Nichols would pass away in 1998 and 2017, Tony Iommi's manager, Ernest Chapman, and Mike Clement, Iommi's guitar tech for Cross Purposes and Forbidden, would both pass away in 2022. Neil Murray and Bobby Rondinelli would continue to work on a host of different projects, while it would be 2006 before Tony Iommi and Tony Martin would speak or see each other again. Tony Martin would release two solo albums, and three fantastic albums in a partnership with Italian guitarist Dario Mollo titled The Cage, along with a wide range of projects and guest appearances, Tony Iommi has announced that the Tony Martin era albums will be getting the deluxe editions treatment, as Headless Cross through Forbidden have been off the market since the IRS deal was completed. Forbidden would go on to be the lowest selling studio album in Black Sabbath's history, with just a little over 80,000 units sold, in comparison, The Eternal Idol sold 180,000, Headless Cross sold 215,000, Tears sold 130,000, and Cross Purposes would sell 120,000. thing is, is the reason why you guys and the rest of the world know my voice mm -hmm. you know and um, I, you have I have to be thankful for that I mean it, it, it's uh, been an honor and a pleasure to be part of it um, it was really hard work for me um, I'm 12 years younger than all of the guys in Sabbath so there was always a gap between us they had so much more experience than me our circle of friends were different so you know, it was yeah. hard work to sort of, I could never really catch them up. They were always going to be 12 years at least ahead of me. So um, it was uh, hard work, but 
you know, it's an important thing, and I, uh, you know, not much to complain about, really. I mean, here I am, 65 years old, yeah. and I'm still recording and stuff on the strength that people know my voice, and the reason people know my voice is because I was with Sabbath.